This episode of The Biggest Table is brought to you in part by Wild Goose Coffee. Since 2008, Wild Goose has sought to build better communities through coffee. And for our listeners, Wild Goose is offering a special promotion of 20% off a one-time order using the code TABLE at checkout. To learn more and to order coffee, please visit wildgoosecoffee.com. In this conversation, I have a rich conversation with Chris Smith of Inglewood Review of Books. We cover a range of topics, starting with his own personal journey of food over the past 10 years. But we spend the majority of our time using a couple of Chris's books, namely Slow Church and How the Body of Christ Talks, to dialogue about the importance of conversation for the health of ourselves and our community. Through the recovery of conversation, we begin to see how God wants to collaborate with us in his work of redemption. Enjoy the episode. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Biggest Table. I am your host, Andrew Camp, and in this podcast, we explore the table, food, eating, and hospitality as an arena for experiencing God's love and our love for one another. And today, I'm excited to be joined uh, by Chris Smith. Chris Smith is the founding editor of the Inglewood Review of Books, which you can access at inglewoodreview.org. He and his wife, Jenny, have three adult children and are members of Inglewood Christian Church on the urban near east side of Indianapolis. Chris is the co-author of the award-winning book, Slow Church, and author of several other books, including most recently, How the Body of Christ Talks, Recovering the Practice of Conversation in the Church. Most of his latest writings end up on the Inglewood Reviews substack, which you can find at theconversationallife.substack.com. Thanks for joining me today, Chris. Hey, thanks for having me, Andrew. Yeah, no, always have enjoyed your work, and so I'm excited um, to to explore food and conversation, um, you know, as we are entering into this time. And so to begin us, just curious, what role has food played in your life uh, growing up and as an adult? Um, yeah, how would you characterize your relationship to food? Well, that's a great question. Um, a big question. Probably <laughs> could spend an hour or more just talking about that. But uh, but to keep it brief, I mean, I've always enjoyed food. Um, my mom was a good cook. Uh, sh- my grandparents uh, had a family farm and uh, and kind of through, through spending summers on their farm really kind of had an opportunity to see a lot of different sides of, um, of agriculture and just that sort of intimate connection with uh, food and land. Uh, and that certainly has stuck with me uh, through the years. Um, yeah, I mean, I think maybe something that we could talk about, but something more recent, I guess, is that probably over the last decade or so, probably about a decade ago, a little less than a decade ago, um, I had become really unhealthy uh, in the ways that I was eating, just not paying attention to what I was eating mm-hmm. and just eating what I wanted to eat. Uh, and eventually in a person's life, that'll catch up to them. Uh, and it caught up to me and I was fairly significantly overweight. And um, yeah, and since so over the last decade, I've been, I mean, I never really liked dieting. I don't really like the idea of dieting uh, and Honestly, the science has showed that for a lot of people, it's not even particularly effective. I mean, it's effective for helping them to lose weight, but not necessarily to uh, be sustainable and keep that weight off. Um, So I've really tried to kind of pursue uh, healthier uh, eating habits, um, trying to eat more plant-based, not not exclusively plant-based, but but kind of leaning into a diet that is is more plant-based and mostly eliminated red meat. Um, that, those, those sorts of things and kind of learning a lot along the way, reading a lot of different folks. Um, I mean, from, from Michael Pollan's, uh, kind of food rules and just kind of thinking about, uh, just kind of some basic philosophy and basic principles of, um, what, what a healthy food is, um, kind of not less processed food, more, he talks about more foods from around the outside of the grocery store, yep. uh, produce and, uh, uh, and so forth. Um, so, uh, so yeah, again, I'm, I'm learning a lot along that way and kind of more recently, uh, just within the last six months or so kind of been introduced to 
the work of uh, Stephen Gundry um, uh, wrote a book called The Plant Paradox. Hmm. Uh, and he's saying that even though kind of plant-based eating is probably the best <laughs> uh, for most folks uh, these days, uh, not all plants are created equal. And he kind of identifies uh, foods uh, called lectins, which is the protein uh, that kind of uh, interferes with the normal functioning of our gut bacteria and actually can um, uh, prompt uh, cravings for uh, carbohydrates and sugars and, um, and uh, yeah, and also just kind of uh, help or inhibit the healthy functioning of our, of our stomachs and which has a lot of kind of uh, effects. Uh, so anyway, all that, uh, yeah. yeah, so, uh, so kind of been learning a lot and still kind of learning a lot about, um, about eating and, uh, and, but, but really all, all the way through, uh, and part of the journey of learning to eat more healthfully over the last eight to 10 years or whatever, uh, has really been driven by the fact that the, the reality that I love to eat <laughs> and yeah. I don't. I don't want to be miserable eating. Uh, I want to eat in ways that are more helpful, but, but try to try to do that in ways that I still uh, really enjoy uh, the foods I'm eating. Um, so, so that's kind of been a, a conversation of sorts uh, right. of, uh, of uh, trying things and, um, and reading, reading things and interacting with them and really trying to f figure out what, what works for me and um, what, what is most healthiest for, uh, for the life that I'm le leading a life, which work-wise is fairly sedentary, but, but I'm also a runner and, uh, uh, a distance coach, hmm. uh, for high school students. Um, and, uh, so can't, uh, cut back too much on my calorie intake, uh, because I'm also, uh, burning a significant amount, um, in, in those endeavors. So as you reflect on this personal journey of eight to 10 years, like how has that then informed your life more holistically? Cause what I've appreciated about your work is you're not, you're not a siloed thinker. You're you uh, want to bring everything into conversation with sure. each other. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think there's a couple things that really stand out there. That's a, again, an excellent question and a excellent, uh, I mean, you've known me for, for probably most of those eight to 10 years, yeah. maybe longer. I can't remember. Um, but um, but yeah, a couple of things really stand out. I mean, one is, I mean, we're always eating in community. Um, I mean, again, uh, the slow food movement, I've learned a lot about that, about kind of the social dynamics around agriculture that brings the food to our table and eating closer to, to our homes, uh, but also the, the social dynamics of, uh, of the home and the, the shared table. Uh, and so, uh, the, the experiments that I've had that I described with kind of learning to eat more healthfully have, have not been in a vacuum. They've always been, I mean, we, as part of a, a church community that shares life together pretty thickly. And I mean, we're always sharing meals together and, and there's a lot of diversity uh, in our, in our congregation in terms of, uh, what people's, uh, preferred or necessary diets are and restrictions and preferences and all of those sorts of things. And, and it's, that's really kind of helped uh, kind of crack, crack my tendency toward idealism. Um, and, and you, again, it's, it's a conversation. You learn to try to, uh, how do I, how do I, as, as a member of this community that is going to share meals together, how do I, um, give and receive hospitality? Mm -hmm. Um, and how do I learn to, to eat in ways that are helpful to me, but also, um, not, um, also, uh, loving and respectful toward my siblings here. Um, so, so, and I mean, even, uh, I mean, m my spouse has her own, uh, sort of, uh, kind of journey toward eating more healthfully. And I mean, I won't, uh, talk about that here, but, but it's not the same, quite exactly the same. Uh, and it hasn't been on the exactly the same timetable as, as mm. mine either. So what does it look like for, I mean, we're right now, uh, within the last couple of years, we've just become a kind of two person household. And, um, if we don't have anything else going on, we're going to eat together. Um, and so, 
uh, what does it mean to uh, to have to share meals together uh, when you're maybe on a little bit different pages of kind of what um, sorts of things you're eating, even if you are generally moving moving in a, a similar direction. Um, so, so that's one thing that really stands out. Mm-hmm. I mean, the other thing too is just, uh, and I've actually been writing a little bit about this week. This this week, I'm working on a, a little book uh, right now, which is kind of uh, kind of out of the the stream of what I've often been uh, uh, writing, thinking about, but it's kind of based uh, in my coaching um, and kind of thinking about uh, athletic performance uh, more holistically uh, and thinking about the ways um, that kind of so many things outside, I mean, regardless of what sport you're doing, uh, whether it's basketball or distance running or swimming or biking or whatever, soccer, um, I mean, you're going to have your training, but you have so many other facets of life that really do affect your your performance and your capacity to to be able to train. And certainly, diet is part of that. Um, and and so, diet is connected to to sleep. It's connected to breathing. Uh, it's connected to um, to so many so many facets of life. Uh, I mean, just connected to. Um, our emotional lives and just the amount of energy we have and the energy that we bring to the work that we do and to the relationships that we have. Um, and, uh, so, I mean, part of, uh, I mean, a big part of learning to, to live more healthfully for me, I mean, it wasn't just that I could be a better person, uh, but it was that really, particularly that sort of, well, I mean, the the holistic sense, um, but but particularly the sort of energy of it, just having having more energy. I, part mm-hmm. of my kind of story with part of the impetus for um, learning to uh, eat and be more healthful um, was that my blood pressure was uh, dangerously high uh, and I didn't even know it probably for for, for several years um, before it was actually diagnosed. Uh, and um, and it meant that meant that I I mean. I would get winded going up a flight of stairs uh, and I just didn't have as much energy uh, at the end of the day or in the evenings, uh, even late afternoons. Um, And so part of the the journey of learning to be more helpful uh, in my eating has been a one of really trying to, to be able to have, have a little bit more energy uh, for, for the work that I do and, um, and to be able to, uh, I mean, I mean, one of the kind of outgrowths of that that journey is is this sort of coaching that I've been doing for about three years now at the the high school in our neighborhood. Right. Yeah. Um, and just want to. You said a lot. Um, <laughs> there are some great points there, but but what I loved too is it's trans. You know, you mentioned it's sort of transformed hospitality for you for the giving and the receiving, which sure. I'm sure the receiving aspect might be harder because you can't control when you're on the receiving end of hospitality, you, you're you not in a place of control, sure. uh, you know, of what happens or what you put in your body at times. Um, mm-hmm. Sure. You know, and sure. so how, how has that factored in as you think about community? Like how do you receive hospitality as one who is entering into more of a plant-based diet? Um, you sure. Know? Sure. Now, again, like I said, I'm not a vegan. Um, yeah. uh, and I, I mean, again, it, it's kind of a, uh, trajectory, I guess, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, plant-based paste eating, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, you do, you, you eat, um, what you serve to you. I mean, maybe sometimes, um, you say, no, thank you. If it's something that, uh, or you just eat small por- smaller portions, right. uh, and, um, and maybe, uh, have a snack afterwards or something. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's tricky again. I'm, I mean, I, I really, I really value, uh, the, the opportunity to, to give and receive hospitality and, and, and just generally my personality is not, um, one of being, uh, legalistic, uh, yeah. in any way or in many ways, um, there probably are things that I'm legalistic about, I guess, uh, but uh, as we all are, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think just uh, uh, learning to, to be gracious and to be flexible and, um, and, to, and to find ways that kind of fit with uh, 
your your needs and and i mean graciously a lot of folks that we um share meals with fairly regularly i mean they know they know the journey that i'm on they know that i don't eat i don't very often eat red meat hmm. um and i mean that, that's kind of one of the main ones yeah. um but uh but yeah and they they actually find ways to to accommodate that i mean again that's that's all conversations uh yeah i mean obviously if i'm eating with somebody new uh, in their home or uh or whatever uh i'm gonna extend more grace just because they don't really know uh the journey that i'm on they don't know who i am um uh, but uh but yeah so so that's yeah it's it's tricky uh but uh but I, I mean, I think there's some some wisdom in just kind of learning to eat the things that are set before you, um, mm -hmm. and, and again, you don't don't necessarily have to like them, and you don't have to uh, kind of eat huge huge portions of them. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I think part of the the nature of of receiving hospitality is um, is uh, being willing being willing to be a little bit adventurous and a little bit, uh, a little bit flexible mm -hmm. in terms of what, what you're eating, even if it's not necessarily things that you would prefer to eat. No. And, um, it all comes back to sort of a conversation, <laughs> you know, sure, conversation sure. with your body, conversation sure. with your sure. community. Um, you know, in a lot of what conversation with science in some sense yeah. in, uh, what, uh, what do we know about how our bodies function uh, and what what is best uh, for our bodies? And again, again, within all the sorts of particularities of kind of the demands that we put on our bodies by by our work and our recreational activities and our family commitments and all of those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. And so conversation has obviously, you know, that the, I the ideas of conversation are near and dear to your work and what you've <laughs> yes, done. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, and so like, as you think about slow church, you know, and um, that thought, you know, I was just looking back, the book came out 10 years ago, which sort yep. of models, <laughs> which is crazy. It's Yeah, but it's absolutely crazy. Um, you know, but slow church is a conversation, mm -hmm. you know, that you, you and your uh, co-author, John wanted to participate in. And so like what, What's the vision behind Slow Church? Yeah, it's um, Slow Church was inspired by the slow food movements, um, but really um, trying to find a, a way of being church um, that is centered centered around the table, of course, a very Eucharistic uh, sort of sense, um, but particularly um, uh, in the, the sort the economy of sharing that happens around the table, uh, sharing of food, sharing of story, sharing of our lives, sharing of other resources uh, that happens through conversations at the table. Um, so that's that's the gist of it fundamentally. And I've had a, had some conversations uh, with uh, Andy Root about this. I actually did a podcast episode with Andy and John Swinton. Um, I was a little bit frustrated uh, that Andy. Uh, doesn't seemingly know what slow food is or doesn't have a deep understanding of the slow food movement. Um, and in such, uh, he's pretty critical of the idea of slow church right. um, in his book. I'm trying to look at uh, the congregation in the secular age. He yep. actually has a chapter on, on that. I'm sure you're familiar with that uh, chapter as well. Um, but um, uh, because slow church and slow food, for that matter, isn't really about slowness as we think of slowness. It is actually about uh, what the German sociologist Hartmut Rosa uh, calls uh, resonance. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't, when we wrote Slow Church, I didn't have access uh, to Rosa's work. It hadn't been translated in English yet. Um, but um, but this notion of, of resonance, of really kind of um, finding finding one's place, finding um, uh, abundant life we might talk about in terms of uh, language that's biblical um, uh, is is what slow church is about. And in, in order to find that abundant life, we have to slow down a bit uh, because uh, 
moving so fast as our culture moves so fast, uh, Rosa, one of Rosa's uh, big things, I mean, is, is the acceleration of society. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and he, he does a wonderful book. His job is kind of his landmark work is a book called social acceleration. Um, for listeners that aren't familiar with that, I would encourage you to, to check that out. Uh, Andy Root is probably, is probably the biggest kind of theological interpreter of Rose's work, uh, and certainly The Congregation in a Secular Age, the book that I was mentioning earlier, um, is, is a great uh, sort of introduction to that. Um, mm-hmm. but, but Andy and I had a great conversation about that, um, and I really tried to, uh, to, to needle him a bit, um, that really kind of what so church was about was about residents, about this kind of thing that's central to kind of what he was co- encouraging congregations to, uh, to, to seek. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, it's about, uh, I mean, certainly the, the gospel of Jesus is about abundant life, or, I mean, oftentimes the, the phrase eternal life, uh, the Greek word for that, uh, which I'm drawing a blank on right now at the top of my head, but, but ro- is more, is as much qualitative as it is quantitative um, yeah. and could often be in many cases in the new Testament could be translated abundant life. Hmm. Um, and how do we find that abundant, that abundant life stems from our, the relationships that we have in community. And that's what we very intentionally chose the language of slow church, uh, not, uh, slow faith or so slow Christianity or anything like that, but slow church, because uh, we really wanted to emphasize that this is something that is experienced in community, uh, in relationship, kind of as we already talked about uh, when we we're talking about hospitality, yeah. um, that it's not just experience. Well, certainly we experience it personally, but we experience it personally within the, the context of, of a community. Mm-hmm. You know, and at, at once, you know, the slow church ideas and the slow food movement, it's, it's universal, but very particular. Mm-hmm. And you guys hammer down on that of like, okay, there's some universal ideas that need to be expressed particularly versus a McDonald's McDonaldization uh, of the church where it's copycat or, you know, uh, it all looks the same. Uh, sure. You know, sure. Yeah. I, I'm increasingly skeptical of, of universals. Um, yeah. I mean, other than perhaps some really basic things like, uh, like God's creation, um, right. uh, or the, the very fact that, that God created. Um, but, but I'm constantly, uh, reminded of the, the rich diversity of, of what God has created and, and really skeptical of the damage and wary of the damage we do when we really try to, to force things into, to universal principles. Um, so, so if there is a universal, universal principle, uh, in, in slow church, it's, it's being critical of kind of the, the sort of, um, uh, one size fits all, uh, mm-hmm. universal ways that we've, uh, received things in, in the modern age, the last 500 years or so. Um, and, and the being critical of, of that mentality and critical of all the sorts of damage it's done kind of racially, economically, uh, ecologically, of course. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so, um, so yeah, but, but really beginning to, uh, to make sense of the world and make sense of life from, from the particular bodies that we have and the particular social bodies that we're part of, particular communities that we belong to, uh, the church and the home and the neighborhood, uh, most, uh, especially, um, and then, then kind of think, thinking and imagining the world outward from there rather than kind of, uh, starting from the, the top down and kind of universal hmm. conceptions of what, what the world is. Well, yeah. So it's starting with the particulars of your community. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, know. even, even more so than that, starting with the particulars of, of your own body right. uh, and your own sort of histories that, that you have mm. from your genetics and epigenetics and your, your parents and the places where, where they lived in the sort of um, ethnic and genetic uh, sorts of histories that uh, were united to create create you as a particular person. Yeah. 
And then, of course, I mean, working outward from there. I mean, right. obviously, already we're starting to look at communities <laughs> yeah. uh, by by the communities, uh, even the genetic uh, familial communities that we're embedded in. Yeah, I never thought about that. Of like, what story do I bring to the community? You know, and what's sure? No, absolutely. Know. And again, I think I I play with that a little bit more in how the body of Christ talks, right? Um, because I mean, I love. I love, I mean, you, you're very familiar with that book, but I love, I love the image of the body and particularly the way that it holds, holds intention and holds together um, the, the particular of unique body parts that have unique functions. Um, but, but they don't function apart from the body. Uh, they only function, they function in and for for the health and well-being of the body. And if they don't, if they're not functioning, uh, I mean, they necessarily function in the body, but if they're not functioning for the body, uh, then then you have a serious problem. Uh, you have serious disease. And, and right. that happens. That's, a, in a sense, what cancer is. You have cells uh, that are are destroying other cells, um, and, and it's deadly. Um, uh, so, uh, so, yeah, that's... Uh, I mean, I think, I think too often it, it's really easy. And I think maybe there were times when I was writing Slow Church and maybe even more recently than that, uh, that it's really easy to get kind of let the pendulum swing too far into the, the social uh, and really kind of lose, us, lose the, the reality of that we are unique persons uh, created hmm. by God and, and gifted distinctively and personally. Uh, by God. And, and it's not just to make me a better person. Um, and it's not for me to get as rich as I can and uh, right. suck the marrow out of life as it were, but, um, but it's for, uh, it's to be shared and uh, uh, to be shared for the, the health and well being of, and the flourishing of the communities to which we belong uh, mm -hmm. and to be, um, to be shared, to be shared generously. Yeah. No, and um, you and I were just talking about Kathy Kahn's book, Loving Disagreement. Sure, absolutely. Um, you, it was the you know, and, Reviews re Book of the Year for 2023. <laughs> yeah, and it was a great book. You know, and, and <laughs> she talked. She and Matt, her co-author, talked a lot about the fact. It's right here on my desk. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, just that the fruit of the spirit is for the sake of the community. You know, oh, and absolutely. We're not. It's not for me to grow. Um, but that as I get to know my body, it's it's for the sake of the community and to to move closer into proximity with others, um, you know? And so what does, what role does proximity then begin to play, um, in, in sure. life? Sure. Yeah. I mean, again, uh, I mean, uh, we were kind of saying, I didn't use the word earlier, but I mean, I'm a localist. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm, uh, kind of, kind of what we described of kind of, uh, moving, moving outward uh, from our bodies into communities is fundamentally uh, a way of proximity uh, of, of learning to pay attention to uh, what, what is closest at hand um, and, and trying to see the world from, from that perspective. Uh, what, instead of kind of, I'm just kind of thinking sociopolitically here, um, but instead of kind of taking up issues in the abstract because they, seem like good ideas. I mean, that's certainly well-intentioned and, uh, but, but really, uh, kind of, I mean, looking at that, at my particular community and what are, what are the challenges that my community faces? What are the injustices, uh, that my neighbors, uh, or even myself, maybe in some cases, um, are, are, uh, laboring under and, and how do we, how do we begin to actually address those, those real issues, um, in the, the concrete particularity hmm. of them, not in, not just kind of as abstract, uh, sorts of, of issues as, of political issues or whatever. Um, but, but really trying to, um, engage, uh, on the basis of, um, real, real injustices that are having, detrimental effects on, on real bodies. No, for sure. Yeah. Cause again, um, you know, in loving disagreement, they talk that shalom is for everyone, you know, oh, yeah. and not just for the select few. And that might mean 
as we address the particular injustices of a community, it's, it's giving up or sacrificing, you know, my power, my, my own self for the good of the community versus just sure. abstract thoughts. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a problem that we have in the American democratic system and particularly kind of ha- since it's been given rise to by kind of modern European liberalism, individualism, um, that our tendency is to, uh, to enter into, uh, our democratic Republic, um, uh, on the basis of what's, what's best for me. Um, Mm -hmm. and I mean, that's not, that's not the gospel. Um, uh, and, uh, and, but rather it's, uh, what's, what's best for, for the communities that I'm embedded. Um, and, and as Wendell Berry, uh, likes to say, I, I'm, I'm going to totally butcher, but there's one of his poems where he talks about, um, kind of the desires that we have, uh, for our community. Uh, we can see that other people have similar desires for their communities. Um, even if kind of the ways that we pursue them and, um, and kind of the ends that those desires lead to maybe, maybe different in different places, but we can at least appreciate that, um, the desires that we have for our community may be, um, similar to, uh, or, uh, in line with the fact that other people in other places have, have desires for their communities, hopes and, and dreams and visions. Mm -hmm. Well, no. And then even, you know, even within one's own community, there are different, there can be different and competing visions of flourishing or what does flourishing look like? And that requires the conversation to, to ensue. And how, conversation in today's culture feels hard to say the least, right? Like, and so how, how do we begin to have a conversation then as a community for what our community can and possibly look like? Sure. I mean, I think the place to start is the reality that however poorly we're doing it, um, almost in almost every church community, there are conversations already happening. There are yeah. spaces in which, uh, people people do talk together, um, and again, it may not be very always very healthy healthy kind of conversations, um, but there are Sunday school classes and committee meetings and uh, board meetings and um, and all of those sorts of things, uh, small groups, um, mm-hmm. all those sorts of things where uh, people are already having conversations, um, and and I, I think the place to start is really kind of leaning into those and recognizing that we are having conversations there. And how do we how do we do that in ways that um, that are more healthy? And particularly, I think one of the elements of health um, that we're often not very attentive to is the dynamics of hierarchy. Hmm. Um, and in terms of kind of. And I mean, there's dynamics of power, obviously related to, to how hierarchy and um, who um, who gets to have a say uh, at the table, and uh, who who are the people that are listened to, and um, whose voices are given more preference than others. I mean, those sorts of dynamics are are really difficult, um, and they're shaped by by lots of of factors. Um, I mean, including race and education and Mm -hmm. perceived leadership and maybe actual uh, titles of leadership. Um, And, uh, and I mean, yeah, so for us at Englewood, uh, kind of in our practices of conversation, a big part of that has really been trying to unmask the desires that we have for hierarchy. And uh, I don't know that kind of, I mean, I think that's still a work in progress. I don't know that we've done it perfectly, but, but we really have become attentive over the years um, to um, some of the, some of the power dynamics and really seeing conversation as a way that we can, can learn to be together in less hierarchical sorts of ways um, and learn to kind of make decisions more, more, in ways that are more like 
consensus um, and not just kind of uh, more heavily authoritarian sorts of of decisions and discernments. Hmm. Yeah, no, the, the place of hierarchy, you know, and I think a lot of times people come to conversation thinking they have the answers versus a listening posture. Absolutely. Um, you know, and so how, how do we begin to even listen well to, to those voices? You know, and I think of myself, you know, I'm a white middle-class male, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm the, at times the poster boy of privilege, you know, like, sure. but, um, how do, how do we in positions of power begin to listen well to our community versus coming in with a heavy hand thinking we have all the answers? Sure. I mean, I think, I think a big part of that is, I mean, creating habits of listening to people on the margins of our community and really listening, uh, not just kind of, uh, checking a box, um, which unfortunately a lot of kind of, uh, practices of diversity and inclusion, um, tend mm -hmm. to, uh, get boiled down to, oh, we've got to, to, to do that. We see this a lot in community development sorts of worlds, um, that, uh, whatever community development organization is, is planning, planning a, a project, planning, planning, a, a residential project or a mixed use project, uh, and, community listening is is kind of part of the process but often so often it becomes just kind of a box to check and there's not really listening to the community it's just mm -hmm. we gave we gave folks an opportunity to have their say uh, but it wasn't really kind of and then we did what we wanted to right. <laughs> it's often the kind of follow-up to the yeah. uh, unspoken often unspoken sort of follow-up to that um, but but really um, building building friendships uh, with with people for whatever reason that are on the margins of margins of our faith communities, margins of our neighborhoods, um, uh, whether that's economically or um, uh, uh, gender-wise or um, racially, ethnically, um, all all of those sorts of things. Um, uh, but putting putting our places putting ourselves in places uh, where we can, can really listen and learn over of the long haul and really build, build meaningful, meaningful friendships. Um, uh, and, and that those sorts of habits uh, will, uh, will bring those uh, with us when we, um, when we have conversations in our churches. Um, yeah. And so as we do this, then, what role can the table and even food and hospitality, like, and not just as a metaphor, you know, but like, sure, sure. you the know, actual table. <laughs> the actual table, yeah. like how can that be a great equalizer um, in this process? Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. Um, certainly being willing, as we, we were talking earlier about receiving hospitality, being willing to, to sit at somebody's table and to, um, to have them serve you the foods that, that are meaningful to them and meaningful to the sorts of families and places and cultures that they have come from. Hmm. Um, and, and is, is a really meaningful, meaningful sort, uh, it built some pretty strong bonds, um, and really goes a long way to, um, cultivating, uh, cultivating friendships. Um, yeah. And again, I mean, obviously, I mean, the table itself also, uh, as kind of the slow food movement has reminded us, I mean, it is a place where, where, where conversations happen, uh, where, um, we really have an opportunity. Uh, people are a little bit more, more relaxed, uh, and, um, uh, and are able to, to share. I mean, obviously the food that is shared is, is, a part of, uh, of our persons and our culture that, that we're sharing together. Um, but, uh, but, but we also have opportunities to, to share stories and to share, mm -hmm. um, share perspectives, uh, and, uh, to, uh, to really, um, to, to learn, to learn from one another. I think the, 
we talk in the slow church book a bit about just kind of the the nature and the kind of the economics uh, section of the book we talk about kind of e- economies work best uh, when there's a sort of mutuality hmm. um, uh, where there's, as we said kind of earlier, when we're talking about hospitality, both both a giving and a receiving. But oftentimes in order for you to get to that point of, of mutuality, of being able to give and receive, oftentimes those of us like, like myself or yourself, um, those that are kind of perceived uh, to be, to have some degree of cultural power, uh, oftentimes... Um, have to be on the the receiving end <laughs> yeah. uh, for a while, the listening end, uh, the attentive end, uh, in order to be able to cultivate the sort of trust uh, that allows. Trust is a big part of, certainly for us, you probably heard me say, that, say this many times <laughs> over the years, um, but the, the best fruits of our practices of conversation here at Englewood is that we are we are learning to and growing in, in our trust of one another. Um, and... Um, and it's our trust of one another that really allows us to have these sorts of economies where we're able to 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 really listen to one another and to really share share with one another um, across across some some significant divides, uh, political divides, economic divides, ethnic divides. Mm-hmm. No, and it and it does take time, and it is that posture of receptivity that. Um, I think I know for myself, uh, and, and as I think about church, like that we need to adopt more, you know, we want to give hospitality to others, you know, um, mm-hmm. whereas are we willing to step into another person's home and receive what they have to offer as a guest versus always trying to be a host? Sure. Uh, sure. There's a lot to learn from Jesus there that Jesus yeah. oftentimes, I mean, Jesus was, was without a home. <laughs> yeah. He had no place to lay. So Almost any time you see Jesus eating a meal, he's eating in somebody else's house. Mm-hmm. Uh, and certainly now a lot of those folks are Jewish and there's fairly there. There's all kind of dietary uh, laws that they kind of mostly adhere to. And um, and that would have a bit of a uniformity toward the the sort of food sorts of foods that were served. Um, but but I'm sure that there was there was some diversity and some. Uh, unexpected sorts of thing because Jesus did eat with a lot of uh, a wide economic variety. Right. And I'm sure uh, across that economic diversity, there was a variety of, of quality of foods uh, mm-hmm. uh, that, that he was served. Um, and um, as best we can tell from the gospel narratives, um, I mean, Jesus, Jesus ate uh, what was served and uh, people uh appreciated uh uh and and trusted him and uh and really uh respected him uh, because of that sort of receptivity of uh being able to kind of receive the hospitality that they offered to him mm-hmm. no and, and the personhood of the person um that he received it from i think seemed to matter more oh, because that's what that's what got him in trouble isn't what he ate but who he <laughs> ate with you know and yep, yep. um becoming yep. ritually un you know he would have been ritually unclean sure i think probably 99 to 100 percent of his <laughs> life uh you know which had huge issues in you know played a, would have played a major role in how he could participate in his religious culture um, yeah but i think one of the one of the things i've really appreciated uh that i think i've learned from walter brueggemann's work um particularly with uh, I mean, as an Old Testament scholar and kind of looking at kind of ancient Israelite uh, culture uh, was the tension between the des- and tension, not necessarily in a helpful way, uh, between kind of purity and neighborliness. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, uh, I mean, certainly we kind of see that kind of played out uh, in Jesus' interactions with, with the Pharisees uh, and that the Pharisees were kind of really uh, driven by by visions of, of purity um, and uh, and certainly it's not difficult to see the ways that a lot of folks today are kind of driven by by unhelpful visions of, of purity uh, of, of whiteness and mm-hmm. purity of what America is assumed to be um, yeah. 
uh, for instance. Um, but but really, uh, neighborliness for Br- Brueggemann and neighborliness as he kind of sees him through the through the person of Jesus is is really about is a way of talking about kind of what what we've already said of of being willing to 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 receive hospitality and to eventually to enter into this sort of friendship in which um, there is a mutuality of, Mm -hmm. of, of giving and receiving um, and care, care for, for uh, one another that, that goes both ways and really kind of respects the, the unique uh, sorts of personhood of, uh, of all, all those involved. Yeah. You know, and, tagging on to what you said it's not being afraid of contamination you know like we get sure. yeah exactly you know, That's a... pu- yeah purity leads <laughs> to an idea that we're going to be contaminated by the other um whereas jesus shows us like his presence is is stronger um sure you know um and will en- enable more love you know and more neighborliness um when we get past that fear of the other sure and i think just kind of to think Kind of, soci- I'm not an expert on this, but uh, kind of think sociologically and ecologically about kind of all the ways that we're kind of contaminated already, uh, just by yeah by exposure to to pollution in the air and pollution in the water and produ- pollution in the land and uh, unhealthy sorts of foods. I think I think a lot of our conceptions of purity <laughs> purity uh, yeah. are really uh grounded in delusions uh mm-hmm. are grounded in um uh uh misinformation and false false conceptions of uh what what the world is um so so yeah i mean i think we we are we live in a broken world and we participate in a broken world and um and and wow yes we should be kind of uh seek, seeking justice in that world um i mean oftentimes as we've said for for the sake of hospitality um there are going to be ways that we might kind of contaminate our ideals mm-hmm. yeah and not to be again to enter into the mess you know, and I think that's a lot of your work is is grounded in this idea that we have to be willing to enter into the mess of life. Sure. Uh, you know, and you know, even as you talk about the body, like you know, when our body is out of whack, you know, or if we're in disease, sometimes getting better involves a lot of pain and mess sure. before there is health and flourishing. Sure. I mean, even our conceptions of our bodies are much more complex and messy than we think. I mean, we think we have this this skin that the, that surrounds our bodies and that it's a membrane, but well, I mean, membrane is probably a better word for it because yeah. all kinds of substances and uh, are, are coming and going and we're, we really exist as kind of a net, this kind of network of, uh, of cells that um, are inherited and shaped by by our environment as well as our genetics and by those people in close proximity to us. And Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly we learned learned a lot about that uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and the the effects of not uh, paying attention to, um, to the ways that uh, diseased cells uh, kind of infiltrate our bodies and the effect, the kind of, uh, large scale effects uh, that that can have, uh, but yeah, but we're always uh, and it's it's been proven as a bit of a myth, um, but just kind of this notion that kind of all of the cells in our bodies kind of regenerate uh, within some period of time. Some people say seven years, sometimes, but but mm-hmm. the cells in our bodies are always kind of dying and and being replaced uh, and. Uh, and that's uh, again kind of a part of the the messiness of of who we are. And even as we kind of think about kind of what what a body is, what a person is, um, uh, it's not. I mean, just from a from a biological level, it's not nearly as neat <laughs> as we um, 
as we might imagine it to be. And so, and that's kind of what leads me to, to really emphasize that, that we, we are conversational bodies. Uh, the, mm-hmm. the, the title of how the body of Christ talks at one time was going to be a conversational bodies. My publisher didn't like that quite as well. They thought it was a little bit harder to wrap your mind around. Um, but, uh, but this, the sense that um, the sort of social life that we should have uh, as conversational is really shaped by, by our existence as um, bodies that are always, always in flux and always hmm. um, existing in a sort of conversation, not only the sort of familiar conversation that's happening at the neurological level, but this sort of kind of cellular conversation of kind of cells entering our body and some of them uh, needing to be resisted uh, and some of them actually being uh, quite, quite healthful for us. So, right. Wow. I think we could keep on talking for a long time all about this. No, <laughs> I'm sure, sure we could. Uh, but as we begin to think about wrapping up, um, a question I've enjoyed talking to other people about and asking and hearing their point is this question of um, what is the story you want the church to tell? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, well, I'll answer it with a non-answer, I think. <laughs> Perfect. I think particularly one of the deepest temptations of our day is to, is the church or Christian people trying to force our stories Hmm. on the world. I mean, fundamentally, that's kind of the nature of Christian nationalism uh, and which isn't a new thing. It's basically kind of the latest incarnation of Christendom of kind of believing that Christianity needs to be in control, (laughs) in control of the world uh, at a large scale or at smaller scales as well. Um, So, uh, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, certainly, I guess, I mean, uh, I mean, if there is a story, I mean, it's kind of what you alluded to earlier that, um, that, I mean, God has created us as unique human beings and loves us immensely uh, in, in all of our uniqueness. Uh, and, and the work, the sort of incarnational work that God has created us for is, is this sort of conversation of, of learning and learning to be with uh, and to share life with and to be in friendship and mutuality and an economy of care and sharing mm-hmm. uh, with with those people closest to us, but but not uh, in a sort of tribalistic sort of way, but in a way that um, that kind of overflows abundantly overflows our local communities uh, to to our cities and to the world at large. Yeah. Um, so. So, yeah, I mean, well, I'm uh, a little bit hesitant about kind of the way stories are used at the present. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess there probably is uh, a story, a story there, but it's, it's, a, it's a different, a different sort of story. Yeah. Um, it's a story about, uh, I mean, it's fundamentally a, a gospel story. Mm-hmm. And it, and, you know, it's, you alluded to it, but it's instead of telling a story, it's listening to the story of your community. Sure. Sure. And yeah, and receiving the, the nature. I mean, I think, again, kind of going back to this nature or to the, the notion that God really desires to, uh, to collaborate with humanity. I mean, that's the nature of incarnation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the nature of our identity as, as the church and as churches. Um, and, and that's, I mean, I think fundamentally that's the posture that we carry into our neighborhoods uh, that it's not we have everything figured out. It's that we want to work together and and you are you. You are neighbors are are loved and you are immensely mm-hmm. gifted and we want to we don't want to take your gifts and and use them for our own glory, but we want to work together so that um this place can flourish and that we all can share in the benefits of um, the goodness of 
who who each of us is and the the sorts of goodness of social bodies that are are coming coming into existence um in which these these things can all be shared yeah well thank you chris um it's it's always good to talk you know to you and i just (laughs) your wisdom and yeah the conversations we've shared over the years and the friendship even that's developed um just really appreciate you and your what what you're doing um you know, you've cost me a lot of money through Inglewood review of books, but <laughs> it, it, you know, it's also been my source of what to read next, you know? And so, uh, yeah, if you're not familiar with Inglewood review of books, please visit Inglewood review, e- review of books and, uh, just always some great books to be aware of through Chris. Um, and so just as we end a few fun questions, I like to ask my guests, um, just about food. Mm-hmm. So what's one food you refuse to eat? Ooh, I probably have lots. Um, the one that most uh, comes to mind first is Brussels sprouts. I, I, I think that I've had some bad experiences with Brussels sprouts over the years. Um, okay. It's just uh, one vegetable. I've struggled to eat vegetables over the years, completely honestly, uh, which is kind of odd in that I'm kind of learning to eat more plant-based now. There's yeah. a bit of irony there, but but especially especially Brussels sprouts. Hmm. I think those that's one food that... Um, uh, has been really difficult for me. Okay. Have you I ever mean, had... I guess, I guess I would eat it if it was served to me, yeah. uh, but I probably would need very much of it. Um, yeah. And um, yeah. Have you ever had but... fried Brussels sprouts? Where I... you flash fry them instead, like, you know, versus the mushiness that I think most people associate with. Yeah. I, maybe, um, maybe I think I've had air fried. Okay. Uh, Brussels sprouts. I don't know that I've had um, kind of deep fried. Yeah. Um, Brussels sprouts. Um, but, gotcha. but okay. usually, usually roasted is kind of, I think how we've, yeah. how we've made them. Um, which, right. Yeah. They're, they're not mushy, no. um, but it's just the, the taste of them, the texture. I'm, I'm a, kind of a big texture person okay. uh, in my eating habits. Um, and so I have weird things that, um, that I don't necessarily like because of the, of having bad experiences with the texture of it. I understand. So on the other end of the spectrum, what's the best thing you've ever eaten? Oh, uh, um, yeah. Oof. I I don't know. Uh, I've eaten a lot of things in my day. Um, uh, I'm not, again, I'm not a gourmet uh, person. Right. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of, kind of drawing a blank, but I mean, I love, I love home cooked foods. Um, I just actually celebrated my 50th birthday. Uh, and our kind of small group uh, from our church got together and kind of one of the, one of the traditions that we have in our small group uh, is that if it's a person's birthday in a week, they get to choose kind of what, what we're eating. Uh, and uh, my friend, uh, Ben, uh, who's uh, in our small group, he and his family, um, he's a, he's a really good cook and he makes a good chili. Um, and so we had, I asked him if he could, could make uh, chili for us. Um, so Nice. And that actually, I actually, it's a, it's a chili with red meat. Uh, so actually, uh, but it's, Hey, you're only, only turned 50 once. Exactly. Uh, so, um, but, but, but yeah, that was really delicious. And, uh, it's kind of the first thing and kind of a recent thing that, that comes yeah. to mind. Fun. And then finally, um, there's a conversation among chefs about last meals, like as in if you, knew you had one last meal <laughs> yes, to enjoy, please. Please. um, what would it be? You know, do you have, if you knew you only had one last meal to enjoy, do you know what you would choose and, and why? Who? Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I think it would be, I think there's probably some contextual things that would help me kind of right. uh, make that sort of decision. Um, but, uh, I mean, I think, uh, I'm a big, again, kind of in contrast to what I've been saying about, uh, uh eating plant-based and trying to avoid red meat. I really do like a good cheesesteak. I come from the East coast. Hmm. Um, and, uh, really, uh, so, so maybe, I, uh, maybe I would have a cheesesteak if it was my last meal and knew I was going to, going to die anyway. Right. Um, I might, uh, really have a, have a good cheesesteak with some, some fried peppers and onions. And, mm. um, I'm not a cheese whiz. There's kind of a big yeah. sort of, uh, several schools of, of cheesesteaks in, uh, uh, Southeastern Pennsylvania. 
and I'm not a cheese steak or a cheese whiz on your cheese steak type person. I'm more a provolone type okay. uh, cheese on your cheese steak. Um, but, uh, but yeah, maybe, maybe that's what I'd have. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you again, um, Chris, for joining us, uh, joining me on this episode and, um, you know, yeah, I would encourage you as a listener to, to explore the Inglewood Review of Books and Chris's um, Substack, which is the Conversational Life, and we'll make sure all these links are in the, the show notes. Um, but yeah, if you've enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, leaving a review, or sharing it with others. Thanks for joining us on this episode of The Biggest Table, where we explore what it means to be transformed by God's love around the table and through food. Until next time, bye. <laughs>